have the honor to introduce to you all one of the great mayors in our time. When we started out in 2013, he said he wanted to make this the best mid-sized city in the country. And my God, we headed in the right direction. We really are. So it is an honor for me to introduce our mayor, Mayor Stephen M. Fulop. Thank you. Thank you. Please take a seat. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you for joining me tonight for my 11th State of the City Address. It's hard not to be a little bit sentimental and nostalgic tonight, so bear with me a little bit. Walking in here tonight, I reminded myself that I only have two more of these State of the City events left before I pass the reins on to someone else. So I told myself that I should try to make the most of it and try to cherish every moment of what I'm gonna convey. After all, we just have so much to be proud of as a city. I'll get to those highlights shortly, but first and foremost, I just wanna start by saying thank you. you know, I am a proud first-generation American. I am the grandson of Holocaust survivors who came small business owners with their deli in Newark. I wasn't born and raised in Jersey City, even though people that were born and raised in Jersey City put that as one of the most important things. But rather, I am someone who chose Jersey City as the place I want to spend my life and raise my family. Now, I was lucky enough to be embraced by this special city, and I've gotten the chance to be on that wall behind you with the other mayors. And to me, that is a crazy story in every way, and it speaks to me about the American dream. So I just want to say thank you. I recently revisited the first State of the City speech I gave just a few months into my first term in 2014. I remember how exciting it was, but it was really very much an aspirational speech. It was very, pretty much, we're going to do this, we're going to try to do that, we'll set a mark for this, and the list went on and on and on. At the time, many people really doubted our ambition, saying that maybe it was a little bit too much of a reach. However, 11 years later, I couldn't be more proud to be standing before you today with all that we've accomplished. I feel that we all should be proud of where we are because it's hard to argue against the fact that the last 10 years has been amongst the most transformational in the city's 250 years. People are expressing their desire to be here with their feet and their wallets by filling apartments and investing here. Of course, all of that progress also brings challenges, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit tonight. Overall, though, I would rather be here in Jersey City, in our situation, than in any other city in the country. Yes. 
if you think about it, if you think about it, we are big enough that we're relevant to every single conversation, and at the same time, we're small enough to be able to experiment with new things and new ideas. We're a city that is more diverse than anywhere in the entire country, and it is a true microcosm of what New Jersey is and the United States of America. We are a city that has been a laboratory of innovation and change for the better part of the past decade. So, if you were to ask me, what is the state of our city? My answer is, it is strong, and we will leave it much stronger than how we received it. <laughs> to me, just this building, City Hall, is really a metaphor and a symbol of our administration. Many of you remember what it looked like when we found it. There were cracked old 1970s styles throughout. Lighting didn't work in a lot of places. You had a flooded basement that couldn't be occupied. The list goes on and on. Everything here has changed. Every office is updated. Around every corner is now something we are proud of. And we did it with a nod to our past, because we are proud of that, and at the same time looking towards the future. To me, this building represents all of Jersey City, and handing it off to the next person in a way that we are proud of is what our administration embodies in everything that we do. Before we start really talking about the important impacts we've made and the continued progress to come, I first want to thank all of you in this room and watching at home for your unwavering partnership in everything we do to enhance this great city. It's... I want to say a special thank you to our devoted Jersey City Council members for their tireless work making sure our city's diverse set of needs are met in every day and every night. I, I also want to take a second and thank the members of my administration and our more than 3,000 city employees for their dedication to bringing our goals and visions to reality. So thank you for being a part of that. So let's start by talking a little bit about last year. 2023 was a year of historic progress for Jersey City. Our efforts have elevated Jersey City to a new level, and everywhere else is taking notice. It's been one of the greatest Renaissance stories in the entire country. Tonight, we were intended on showing some pictures of before and after of our biggest project spanning the city so that you could see the physical growth that is driving our economy, but also the meaningful changes that benefit residents by building a smart, equitable, inclusive city. We're gonna put those online so it's easier for people to see. But there is a good reason why we are ranked one of the best places to live in the United States. We continue to be ranked nationally for major driving factors such as job growth, economic activity, and equitable opportunities. But it's not only us declaring it about ourselves. You see, survey after survey recognizing the city in national publications that we were never a part of before. From travel and leisure, citing our public arts, or top-notch restaurants, and convenient public transportation options, to beating out New York City and San Francisco as the country's most LGBTQ plus friendly city in the United States. Now, that was written by the largest LGBTQ plus publication in the United States. So it gives you a little perspective on what we're doing here. And why, you may ask, it's no accident that that's happening. It's an earned reputation that we've worked hard to achieve, and it will be our legacy as we stand here today, surrounded by a level of progress that surpasses any other place in the state and the region. As a As I often say, a healthy city is a growing city, and we are growing faster than most other cities around the entire country. Over the past decade, we've permitted nearly three times the number of housing units per capita as New York City. Think about that for a second. You constantly hear city leadership elsewhere saying, and I quote, we want to be a city of yes, but here in Jersey City, it is actually happening. As I promised when I ran for mayor, we moved away from the decades-old practices of just relying on tax abatements to attract interest. Yet even with eliminating tax abatements, we still achieved unprecedented progress. <laughs> uh, 
development remains strong. And this is a true testament to our efforts in establishing Jersey City as a unique place where people want to live, where they want to work, and they want to enjoy all that the city has to offer. While cities around the region have certainly slowed down, we didn't, despite the fact that we put more and more protections for residents by forcing developers to build more affordable housing, like the state's successful and biggest in, uh, inclusionary zoning ordinance and the state's first affordable housing overlay zone. Even with these new rules and requirements, we are still seeing an unprecedented investment into our city. Last year, in a tough economy, we added $1.4 billion in new rateables to our tax rolls. It's a crazy statistic, but again, it speaks to the health of our city. So we have a lot to do. To accommodate this growth in 2023, we launched an online portal under HEDC. The online portal will expedite the thousands of permits and forms submitted annually under HEDC and the MUA. We continue to be a city of yes. <laughs> Jersey City continues to lead the state with the most approved building permits, reaching nearly 6,000 last year. Our 2023 housing starts, our revenue, our construction code are all now in line with where we were in 2021 when the housing market would has historically low interest rates at that point and the market was much easier. This speaks again to the strength of our local economy. It is all great news on that front, but the focus for us has really been how do we embrace the new investment and at the same time protect our existing residents. As a result of our new policies, we have approved more units of affordable housing than ever before in Jersey City's history. This is... <laughs> this is proof that the IZO, Inclusionary Zoning Ordinance, and the Affordable Housing Overlay are a success. We moved forward last year, and this year we will break ground with Bayfront. That's a big deal. It is a 8,000 unit project that is 35% affordable housing located on the west side of Jersey City, and it represents one of the largest projects in the Northeast United States, right here in Jersey City. It was... It was our administration with the city council that put together more than $100 million investment to create that huge commitment to affordability. At my first state of the city 11 years ago, I spoke then about the potential for the west side of Jersey City. Today, I am proud that you can visibly see the changes with cranes everywhere and new small businesses. Our vision has been met with tangible action. But we're not only building more units, we're also reimagining outdated public housing and turning it into mixed income communities like what we're doing at Holland Gardens. Holland Gardens will represent the largest new public housing project in all of New Jersey. Additionally, we'll offer home ownership opportunities to residents who may not otherwise afford their own place to call home at Holland Gardens, because we recognize that the best way to get people out of poverty is investing in mixed income communities where the environment fosters improvements. That's what we're doing for our most vulnerable residents here in Jersey City. I'll tell you also that, of course, there's no easy fix to the many challenges surrounding housing and homelessness. That's why we took a more holistic approach with the new St. Lucie's Homeless Shelter. In September of last year, I was joined by Cardinal Tobin and many others to open the newest St. Lucie's building with services expanding well beyond food and shelter to finally include more permanent actions that help people actually break the cycle of homelessness. In Bergen Lafayette, we've invested more than any administration in history. In my second state of the city, I spoke about aggregating all of that rented office space that the city had on the waterfront to a location that was struggling in the city, and we would commit to bringing city services to areas that didn't have it. At the time, I was faced with large rooms kind of like this, filled with critics of the plan. But to me, leadership is about articulating a vision venturing outside of the comfort zone and hopefully bringing people along for the ride. Last year, we opened the doors to the public safety headquarters located on MLK Drive. That is the fourth and final building and it completes the vision that we initially articulated. 
it's hard to argue that it hasn't been a success. We've established in that area greater access to critical services. We've moved thousands of jobs there. Investment into the Bergen Lafayette neighborhood is happening for the first time. Because of our commitment from a financial sense, you see for the first time real investment in private sector housing close to the City Hall Annex. And that's not an accident. That's because investors see we are a city of action, not just rhetoric. Again, we are a city of yes. Just two miles north of there, Journal Square is experiencing a revitalization unlike anything we have seen in Jersey City's history. You all remember what that looked like a decade ago, with every mayor since the 1960s saying they would bring back Journal Square. Well, guess what? There isn't a city in the country that can boast as much investment in a tight urban core as we have in Journal Square. Next month, we'll break ground on the Lowe's Theater restoration project with Governor Murphy to revive that iconic theater. World-class shows will once again be in Journal Square, attracting thousands of visitors from all over the region. That translates to countless people year after year coming into Jersey City, people dining at our restaurants, people staying at our hotels, and people spending at our local businesses. This was a tremendously complicated endeavor that was talked about forever but it is finally getting done. The same can be said for the Centre Pompidou, Jersey City, located around the corner from the Lowe's. The Centre Pompidou, for those of you that don't know, is the largest collection of modern and contemporary art in all of Europe. Locations in Shanghai, Brussels, Paris, and more. And we'll soon add Jersey City to the premier list as the only North America location. My belief is that there is no reason why Jersey City shouldn't have the best of the best in everything. And that is what this project speaks to. Why do you need to look across the river with envy about culture and art there? Why a chip on our shoulder sometimes? We deserve the best. We should inspire our children with the best in the world. And that is what we'll be doing here. So we're done with the construction funding, and we're now in the final conversations with the governor's office on next steps. Future generations will know Jersey City as the arts and entertainment destination that we are building today. But again, with all of this, affordability is key to our plans, and Journal Square is a key part of that plan. In the next few months, we'll be enacting a new affordable housing ordinance for Journal Square, and we're going to be working closely with the city council to get that done. There is a lot of progress happening in Journal Square. And in a couple of years, it will once again be the heartbeat of our city. <laughs> Beyond the Lowe's and the Sancho Pompidou, with regards to arts, local artists are a priority for us. We're supporting public art and arts education through the Arts and Culture Trust Fund in an unprecedented way. In the first two rounds alone, we awarded $2 million in grants to 200 local artists. We are the first city in New Jersey to do this. The much needed financial aid has already demonstrated its value as evidenced by a 50% increase in applications submitted this year for the next installment. Reviving the city's arts community has proven to be a worthwhile investment for all of us. Jersey City's nonprofit and arts culture sector generates $46 million in economic activity every single year. It supports over 500 jobs in our city and contributes $28 million in personal income to city residents. So why do I care so much about investing in the arts? Well, I'll tell you, art, culture, nightlife, those are key deciding factors for why people choose to live in dense urban areas, and we as a city need to recognize that as part of our vision for the 21st century. But what else do people care about when living in dense cities like Jersey City is a good question. They care about diversity, of course that is important. Arts and culture and nightlife, as I just mentioned, obviously important. But safety is the foundation, because without it, there is no room for anything else. We have made huge progress, including record-breaking decreases in crime citywide. 
I made it clear from day one, 10 years ago, that we would turn the page and reduce crime by double-digit percentages. Today, we have reached and exceeded our most aggressive goals. In 2023, we had the lowest number of homicides in Jersey City's history. Let me just... <laughs> Let me say that again to emphasize the importance of what we achieved. Thanks for the efforts of our Jersey City Police Department and the public safety officials. Last year, we had the lowest number of homicides in Jersey City since records have been kept. In fact, the data shows we had the lowest homicide rate of the top 100 cities along the entire East Coast. The data also shows you we had the lowest homicide rate of the top 100 cities everywhere east of Texas. <laughs> Furthermore, we had a lower homicide rate than our neighbors New York City for the first time in decades. A reason for that is of course the over 1,000 CCTV cameras installed by our administration and the city council. The cameras allow our law enforcement officers to be much more efficient and effective in solving crimes and prosecuting bad actors. For the first time, we closed out 2023 with a 100% solve rate of homicides. We are taking the most violent criminals off our streets and we are putting them behind bars. These aren't just numbers or sound bites. These are real results from strategic and aggressive efforts to curb crime 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. What's more is we created a pastor program that works with victims of violence in all of our communities and even the families of perpetrators to provide help and guidance at any violent incident throughout the city. As I often say, there is no greater tool than our community partnerships, and we'll continue to work closely with our local leaders and residents to build trust and create a safer environment for everyone that lives here. <laughs> Part of our strategic public safety efforts includes solutions to the most stubborn problems that have created barriers between police and communities for decades. Generally speaking, those issues focus around transparency. In a few weeks, we're going to open our new de-escalation and training center to raise the bar well beyond the standard training for police and fire. It will be the only facility in the area dedicated solely to public safety. We can use the simulator there to recreate an entire range of emergency scenarios so that our officers will get top-notch training on better protocols in countless high-stress situations. But one of the best parts of the new training center is that you will be able to go there. It will be open to the public to experience firsthand what it's like to be in a situation where every second counts. We are planning for the future. And as I said in my opening, we will leave the city better than the way we received it. The Jersey City Fire Department. I can't forget about the best fire department anywhere in the country. <clears throat> I will also tell you it's the largest municipal fire department in the state of New Jersey now. Last year, our firefighters responded to more than 17,000 calls for service in Jersey City. That's an average of 48 emergency responses every single day. <laughs> Since 2013, we, the administration and the city council, has hired 823 police officers and 377 firefighters. At each of the 50 swearing-in ceremonies that I've done since 2013, I always thank the families for entrusting us with their loved ones. I make sure at every one of those to tell the families that I know my job as mayor is to make sure that their loved ones have the necessary training and equipment so that we can return them home safely after each shift to their loved ones. I take that, what I say to those families, very, very seriously. And we make the investment to ensure that our public safety personnel have that training and resources they need to stay safe. This time, because it is important to me, I want to just ask those council members, all of them, to please stand so that they can be properly recognized because the money wouldn't be there if they didn't have the commitment to public safety.
Thank you. There is no greater responsibility than the safety of our community, and safety leads to investment elsewhere. In 2023, we completed one of the largest citywide park improvement plans in decades, with over 25 park updates. We completed upgrades to Leonard Gordon Park. In Bergen Square, we're building a whole new plaza and park. In November, we opened the first playground at Monticello Park. We also created 12 new plazas and public spaces throughout the city. Our administration has also demonstrated an unprecedented commitment to creating brand new parks that didn't exist before. It was our administration with the city council that invested the dollars to finish Berry Lane Park. We built the new Bethune Park. We created the new Fairmount Park. We added the new Coles Park, none of which previ previously existed. And we have set the way for the new three-acre courthouse park, which will soon be the first large park in all of Journal Square. And nearby there, we're adding even more pedestrian-friendly spaces with the city's second pedestrian plaza called the Homestead. It was part of our approvals for development in the area, and it will be retail-only corridor for shoppers in Journal Square. The Homestead is based off of our successful Newark Avenue pedestrian plaza, which was initially met with criticism when we first proposed it. Nine years later, the now permanent Newark Avenue Plaza has grown into a premier destination for shopping, dining, and community events. This will be the same for Journal Square. Finally on parks, after 30 years of discussion with little action, we will reopen Reservoir 3 to the public next month as the bridge nears completion. This will create a safe, cohesive walkway around the entire reservoir with greater public access. We have made the necessary investments to significantly improve our park and open space networks citywide, and we are very proud of that. Our commitment to parks is certainly unprecedented, and the proof is in our actions. As a result of our ongoing efforts, 95% of all residents now live within a short walking distance to parks. Parks and open spaces are critical for growing communities. With each project, we are intentional about incorporating sustainability elements to mitigate flooding and other critical infrastructure. We've also made it common practice to work directly with the community in order to best meet their needs. You'd be hard-pressed to find another city achieving this level of progress and in such a community-centric way. There is no denying that Jersey City has become a gold standard for smart growth and, of course, community engagement. But investing in the next generation isn't only about playgrounds, though. Next month, we'll open the doors to a new public library in Bergen, Lafayette. The Communipal Library will extend well beyond books to promote STEM education and advance equitable access to state-of-the-art technology. We have made huge investments in our library system, not only renovating places like the Priscilla Gardner Main Library, but also planning new libraries in areas that need it, like the Harl Holland Gardens renovation plan that I mentioned earlier tonight. It's a commitment that we have made, and again, our actions speak to it. From, <laughs> from new libraries, to public parks, to affordable housing, and everything in between. As Jersey City experiences a historic renaissance, we are making sure our residents and communities benefit most. Continuing with the theme of the next generation, people often ask me about schools. As a parent to, two, to, to three children myself, two of which are here today, Stasi and Jackson, <laughs> This is something I think about often. Since I took office in 2013, our administration has been a part of creating five new schools that are either completed or under construction for a total of 3,000 new seats in Jersey City. And we did it all without any help from the state. 
No other city in New Jersey can speak to anything near that. We've built charter schools, we've built traditional public schools, and we've built county public schools. We have been consistent proponent of using our development tools for meaningful community givebacks because I know we can't do it with government resources alone. Liberty Science High School will break ground in the next few months, and it will be one of the region's best STEM schools, providing generations of students with real-world experiences that include the 100 startup companies on site. I'd like to ask Paul Hoffman to stand, the president of the Liberty Science Center, who's been our partner in this. SciTech City was a bold plan we mentioned first in our third State of the City address. At the time, people poked fun at the name, and I can appreciate that, but here we are with six Fortune 500 level companies invested in SciTech City. Scholars Village, which is part of Liberty Science Center, SciTech City, went before the planning board last month, and it's scheduled to break ground this summer. And then later this year, we'll start work on Edgeworks, which is also part of SciTech City, and that's the incubator space for startups. I'm going to reiterate, the investment of millions of dollars from Fortune 500 companies speaks to how significant this project is, and it speaks to our administration's willingness to dream big because Jersey City residents deserve to have the best of the best right here. I want to switch topics now to talk about the importance of promoting a healthy lifestyle to improve quality of life, and we've made great strides in improving public health. As part of our outreach efforts, Health and Human Services launched mobile testing to deliver services directly to communities across the city and encourage everyone to stay healthy. Last year alone, our team took 6,400 seniors on field trips. We served 200,000 meals to senior residents, and that's a 15% increase from 2022. At the same time, HHS, Health and Human Services, hosted 300 substance abuse prevention workshops. And we also created the Veteran Suicide Prevention Coalition as a lifeline for our veterans in need of support right here in Jersey City. As a result of these many successes, the department was awarded $8 million in grants to fund essential city services that residents rely on every day. It's worth noting that the last senior center also in Jersey City was built before I was born. But over the past decade, I think we can all acknowledge our seniors' investment has been unprecedented. Older adults are dependent on community resources now more than ever for a safe, and for an active social life. To meet the growing demand, next month, we are opening a new senior center on Central Avenue that is unlike anything the city has ever had before. Tony, clap. We, remind, we remain mindful of the basics here. We are seeing incredible progress, and we will keep working with community partners to build on that momentum in improving public health and safety for every single resident. This commitment extends to the welfare of animals in Jersey City as well. The recent transition to full-service animal control, now run by the city under HHS, was no easy endeavor, but it will guarantee humane treatment and enforcement for animals in need. By bringing these services in-house, we can have longer operating hours to encourage more adoptions and also encourage more licensing. And I just want to give HHS a lot of credit for getting that done. Progress like this doesn't happen without people having the courage to think outside the box and try new things. And we've proven over the past decade that we will not settle for the ineffective status quo here. This may be most obvious in our approaches to significantly extend our transportation infrastructure. We have invested more in transit than any municipality in New Jersey. Jersey City is one of the busiest transportation hubs in the nation, and we continue to raise the bar for creating safer streets and improving mobility. Connectivity plays a central role in building a sustainable city and improving lives. From cars and bikes to ferries and everything in between, nowhere else in the nation is creating a robust transportation network like we are here in Jersey City. 
More than half of our 300,000 residents travel to work by foot, by bike, or by mass transit. From the recent expansion of city bike stations to launching city-run ferry operations, our efforts in meeting the community needs speaks for itself. Since becoming the first city in New Jersey to adopt Vision Zero five years ago, we have become a national leader in creating safer streets for pedestrians and drivers with a wide range of safety improvements. To date, we have installed over 700 speed humps, 550 intersection upgrades, and over 20 miles of protected bike lanes. We know that Vision Zero is possible. Why do we know it's possible? Because we achieved that aggressive goal in 2022 when we had zero traffic deaths on city streets. While we've made significant progress making our streets safer, though, there is still work to be done. VIA is another example of how we are taking control of our transportation destiny. In the spring of 2019, we faced a serious crisis as affordable transit options were disappearing, largely that impacted minority and low-income communities. We knew we had to take action with a different approach. That's when we found a solution a city-run microtransit service specifically targeting transit gaps in the Heights and the Southwest areas of the city. Despite launching during the pande de pandemic, we have established one of the nation's most successful programs of its kind in terms of ridership, efficiency, and social impact, with 80% of the rides serving people of color and 60% serving low-income residents. Our VIA program recently reached a huge milestone, major milestone, of two million rides in Jersey City. Here in Jersey City, we've created a blueprint for how public transportation should look across the state of New Jersey, further establishing Jersey City as a coveted place to live, to work, and to play. So why are we investing in transit? Because over 30% of Jersey City households don't own a vehicle, and we wanna help more people move around the city without relying on personal vehicles by providing options that are cheap, options that are safe, and options that are green. We're also leading the country in electrification and sustainability to achieve a healthier and more equitable city. We are incorporating greener technology as it is a cost-saving and a long-term investment that benefits the environment, it benefits taxpayers, and most importantly, it benefits all of our health. Through grants, we've integrated electric vehicles into our fleet while retiring older gas-powered vehicles. In fact, we recently became the first on the East Coast to deploy fully electric garbage trucks. Taking a further step, we're empowering our electric vehicles with solar panels installed at our public works campus, which also supplies electricity to the entire building. This year, we're gonna to expand to 90 public and municipal charging stations throughout the city at no cost to taxpayers to strongly encourage and promote electric vehicle use. Public health is all encompassing. It's the health of our surroundings, it's physical exercise, it's mental health, and of course, social well-being. That's why we've put an emphasis on providing our younger residents with the skills and activities they need to succeed. Since expanding our Department of Recreation to include youth development, we've successfully established new programs and enhanced existing recreation to be more inclusive of everyone's ability and interests. In 2023 and 2024, we have put a greater emphasis on expanding services for children and families with special needs. Our ultimate goal is to provide all youth in Jersey City with the opportunity to play team sports, to participate in social programs, and clearly make physical gains. We've also seen a huge boost in engagement since the June launch of our online portal for more accessible field scheduling. As a result, 140 different organizations touching thousands of children were issued field permits between June and December, impacting everybody in the city. These These programs directly align with our goal of creating a diverse offering of educational activities for all residents that live here. So, when I ran for mayor in 2013, 
I made my ambitions clear for what I plan to accomplish in Jersey City on every single front. 11 years later, I am proud to say we've not only seen those plans to fruition, but we exceeded many of our goals. I could go on and on tonight about many of the accomplishments and more of the progress we've made, but I think it's about time that I wrap it up. I hope, though, that your one takeaway from tonight is that our city is not only on the right track, but we are still in the very early stages of what this Renaissance story will mean to generations to come. Last year, I announced I'm running for governor of New Jersey, and this will be my last term as mayor. Thank you, Raj. I want to say something about that. I want to say something about that because it was not an easy decision because I love this city and I'm never leaving here with my family. However, I do believe it is healthy for a city to transition leadership for fresh ideas and fresh perspectives. Trust me, if I could be mayor of Jersey City forever without conscious of whether it is the best thing for Jersey City, I would do it. This has been a dream job, but I know in my heart that transition and change are necessary for progress here. So why do I share that with you? Because my love for this city is deep. It is a special place with vibrant communities made up of amazing people. With all that said, in the next 20 months, we still have so much work to do, and there will be no slowing down. We're going to work every single day with that same energy as my first day in office, and we continue to build together the best mid-sized city in our United States of America. And with that, I say thank you for coming tonight, learning about the city, and let's continue to build Jersey City to greatness. Thank you.